happy Sunday and welcome back to the Chateau de la Lande where today we are in my boudoir. The room name boudoir comes from the French verb bouder which means to sulk. So welcome to my sulking room. Instead of a room tour this week I would like to tell you a little bit about our life at La Lande and one of the most exciting things that we do here for me are our costume parties and I especially love the ones where I actually make my own costume. So I'd like to show you some of the costumes that I've made over the years. My love of costumes and of making them dates back to long before I bought the chateau when I was studying theatre studies A-level. As part of the A-level, you could choose to specialise in a different area of theatre and I chose costume design and designed costumes for the play Amadeus. Already at 17, I loved everything to do with 18th century costume. I'd been really influenced by the incredible film Dangerous Liaisons with John Malkovich and Michelle Pfeiffer and Glenn Close. So I wanted to do something along those lines and Amadeus was the perfect choice. I'd never made a dress before in my life, so launching in with an 18th century dress was no mean feat. In order for me to do the project, my parents bought me a Genome sewing machine, and unbelievably, all these years later, it's still the sewing machine that I've used to make all of the curtains at La Lanse. so that was one of the best buys ever. In order to make the dress, because I was starting from zero, I got a book that stood me in really good stead ever since. It's Janet Arnold's Patterns of Fashion. I think that there are lots of different ones in this series. This is the only one that I have. This is women's dresses from 1660 to 1860. And that helped me a great deal. In fact, you can see that the one on the front cover is very similar to the one I ended up creating. So here she is. My first ever dress, the one that I designed for Constanza Mozart. And please remember, I was only 17 and it's now over 25 years old. So it stood the test of time pretty well, considering it gets used at parties a lot. This style of dress would have been from around the 1780s and it's called a dress a la polonaise or Polish style because it's looped up at the back. And there you can see that it's looped up in three parts at the skirt. I had decided to use costume to highlight the vulgarity of Mozart and his wife in the play. So Constanza always had clashing colours, very bold colours, shiny fabrics, hence the green dress mixed with the yellow underskirt. A little bit of lace, at the time I couldn't afford much lace, so there's just a little bit of machine lace around the edges and I had a bum roll which went underneath the skirt to give it that slight 18th century shape. It was a school project. I was not in charge of the budget. My parents were in charge of the budget and that meant that I couldn't get the fabrics that I wanted. I had to get much cheaper fabrics, but I created a robust dress because all these decades later, it is still regularly used at parties here. And in fact, Marie looked stunning in it quite recently. As you can see, I made a matching hat that had a bow that would hang just about there, at the back of the head. So the idea is that it would sit something like this over a huge wig. Again, the inspiration came from Glenn Close's costumes in Dangerous Liaisons. The project was a big success. I got an A in my theatre studies A-level, but then I didn't have a chance to make another historic costume for years and years until I was at La Lande. We'd already developed a tradition of having costume parties every Easter, and I'll tell you more about those in another vlog. Most of the time we just buy costumes or put things together with existing things that we have. But we were doing a legendary lovers costume party and I suddenly thought I would like to go as Madame de Pompadour. And I didn't want to use the dress that I'd made for Amadeus, I wanted something a little bit more spectacular. In wanting to make a dress in the style of Madame de Pompadour, I had a great reference to Tantu because my father once bought me the Tashin complete costume history, quite heavy, and this is a beautiful book because it goes through all parts of the world and all different eras. So if I needed to make a medieval costume, I would have had perfect things to draw on here. Or medieval, maybe medieval next. I could happily 
sit and spend hours reading this book and in fact that is probably what I will do for the rest of the afternoon. They have peasant clothing and royal clothing. I have to admit I'm slightly more drawn to the aristocratic side of the scale. There's an entire double page spread devoted to women's hairstyles in France in the 18th century. For the legendary lovers party I did my hair myself and I curled it up into this sort of style, though nowhere near as high. In Madame de Pompadour's time it was lower anyway. And then I used a sort of white powder spray for the hair to make it as white as possible and stuck fresh flowers into it. If you like making costumes and you want a biblical treasure trove of inspiration, then I really recommend this book. When it came to making the Madame de Pompadour dress, I'd already made the Constanza dress with the bum roll and I wanted this to be a lot more spectacular. So I wanted the full panniers. I originally made the panniers and they were fine, they worked okay, but they weren't that comfortable. They sometimes flopped a little. I wasn't delighted with them. And one day I was in a mask shop in Venice, just wandering through one of their back rooms when I saw panniers hanging from the ceiling, just amidst the masks. And now I have these beautiful panniers. They're light, they're comfortable, and I'm sure I'm going to make a lot more dresses in future that I can wear them with. I was still very much working on a budget. For a start, I thought that the entire thing might turn out to be a complete failure. So I decided to use some fabric that I'd bought ages ago, I think on eBay, and which I'd been using as tablecloths for summer garden parties. And then I decided to make it far more glamorous with the use of lace. And in that, I was really, really lucky because often in the brocants and in the charity shops in France, you can find little fragments of old lace quite inexpensively. And I'd been collecting these whenever I went to the brocants. So I had a really good collection of old lace and I decided to throw all of it at this dress. This is the finished dress. I used all of those wonderful bits of lace that I've been collecting over the years. I love the delicacy of the pink mixed with the soft old lace. And my favorite thing about wearing the dress is the lace at the cuffs. It's extremely impractical. I do not know how women ate in those days. I have to have things handed to me and end up eating rather like this. But every gesture feels elegant. It transforms every movement. It's actually very joyful wearing sleeves like that. It's a bit of a pity we don't do it more often. This is, I think, still my favorite dress. The annoying thing about it is that because I made it as it would have been in the past, you actually have to sew yourself or pin yourself into it. And that's incredibly annoying and time consuming. And now I think I should probably change it and in future I'll make dresses differently. But the good thing about it is that if I hadn't done that, I would probably have worn it every day since then and completely ruined it anyway, because I think I could happily live in this. Why can't we dress like this anymore? Along the back, I cut out little pieces of lace, little leaves, and I applique them to the fabric because I love the very fitted shape of the backs of 18th century dresses and I wanted to draw attention to it as much as possible. Not bad for our summer picnic fabric. I think the highlight of my time wearing this dress was being able to go to the Venetian carnival in it and that was heavenly. I also discovered something very remarkable we say now that our modern clothing is very practical compared to the clothing of the past. And in terms of the amount of time it takes to get dressed, there's no doubt that that's true. But those dresses were miraculous in terms of pockets because inside each of those panniers would be a hung bag effectively inside them and a little slit cut in the skirt on top. So there was an enormous amount of space to put things in. And what's more remarkable is because the weight was being taken by your hips, it's fairly effortless to carry quite a lot of objects. Comfortably able, I have discovered, to put glasses and hip flask in one and, most miraculously, hot water bottle in the other. So as I was wandering around the Venetian carnival in February, which, believe me, is not a warm experience, I had a self-heated skirt. 
I think I was the only warm person at the carnival. I loved that experience so much that I was just longing to go again. And when I was finally able to, I decided to wear a new dress. But in the meantime, I'd been given a dress by a singer who used to come to the workshops here, a wonderful lady who'd worn this costume many times in her life and was handing it on to me. It didn't have any panniers and it was much too big for me. So I decided that I would rejig the skirt so that I could fit the panniers underneath and then make the bodice much more spectacular by creating a new front piece for the bodice. This dress already existed, but I completely transformed the bodice, which was plain velvet, by cutting it in half, making it much smaller, and adding this jeweled stomacher, which is an overlay covered in jewels onto the original velvet, and then lots of braiding added in gold. And I also added lace. I didn't have so much lace left over after the extravagance of the previous dress, but I added what I had because I think it just makes it much more glamorous and much more in keeping with the age. It looks less like a bought costume and more like something that's come through time back to us. I'd also been given a very old fur coat by my singing teacher, which was pretty moth-eaten and falling to bits. And I knew I was never going to wear it. I tend not to wear fur out and about, but it was perfect for creating the lining of a cape, which could go on top of that dress and make me even warmer that year at Carnival. Here it is. This is the old coat that I was given and I hate to waste fur. And I know that some people would rather not wear it at all, but I think that once the animal has died a long time ago, it's absolutely wrong to waste what we have. So I turned it inside out and made the inside, the outside, by adding this lovely rich brocade that I bought when I was in Venice. I cut it so that you can see it just gets longer towards the back, which had a bit more of an 18th century feel to it. And there you can see the back, it's very simple. It took me ages to get the almost lack of shoulder right because of course these old fur coats have absolutely huge shoulder pads and trying to reduce them, I'm no furrier, I had no idea what I was doing, trying to reduce it to more of an 18th century silhouette took a really long time and was very frustrating. I wouldn't rush to work with fur again, but I was jolly glad to be wearing it in the cold. I had to make the changes to that dress and make the entire cape without a sewing machine because I made them whilst I was in Venice for three weeks leading up to Carnival. So they were all made by hand just as they would have been in the 18th century. And once I was in Venice, I happened to be walking past a brocante and I spotted a hat in just the right color, a little Venetian tricorn. I added some silk flowers and ribbon and a veil, of course. And so this was my hat with the dress. As you can imagine, with this on and my hidden hot water bottle under here, I was snug as a bug in a rug for the whole of Carnival. I went to see an exhibition at Versailles at the Palais du Trianon, which made me even more enthusiastic about creating costumes based on styles of the past. I have the brochure of it here. It's called Le 18e au goût du jour, and it's all about using the 18th century for inspiration in clothing made today. It's been one of my favorite exhibitions ever, and I think I was most blown away by John Galliano's clothes because the way he takes styles from the past and mixes them up to create something new and as though it stepped straight from the page of a modern fairy tale is really super inspirational for me. But I also love the way that Nicola Gueschia for Balenciaga used the 18th century masculine styles to create outfits that I could comfortably wear today. I think that the jackets and the corsets work perfectly and they have a very modern twist. Two other notable designers working in this tradition are Christian Lacroix and Vivian Westwood. And I have several Vivian Westwood cocktail gowns because it's absolutely that 18th century inspiration that draws me to her work. And in all of the dresses that I've made since then, I very much kept these principles to heart. I've only made one more historic costume and that was for the party that I hosted for all of the people in season one of Escape to the Chateau DIY. The theme for that party was come as one of the previous owners of your chateau. 
and I obviously chose our most illustrious previous owner, La Grande Mademoiselle, the cousin of Louis XIV. So I spent ages poring over a lot of the old portraits of her, trying to get inspiration for my costume. And I finally found this portrait, in which she's shown actually wearing an armoured breastplate and holding a shield and a spear, after she took part in a rebellion against the king called La Fronde. I would love to do a video telling you more about her in future, but for now I'll stick to the clothing. Using this as my inspiration, I created my first 17th century dress. This time, I knew that I was capable of doing it, so I allowed myself to be much more elaborate in my choice of fabric. I had bought this stunning silk brocade many, many years ago at Gainsborough Silk Mill in Sudbury. They create fabrics for the Houses of Parliament, Buckingham Palace, really stunning fabrics. And I presumed I would use it on a chair or a curtain somewhere in the house, but I let myself take it out of the cupboard and use it for this dress. I'm really glad that I did because it's the fabric that makes the dress. The way it glints in the light, especially in parties that are lit with candlelight. This is my Grande Mademoiselle dress. I had such fun wearing her. It's the first time I met lots of my friends from Escape to the Chateau DIY and Michael Petherick has been here hundreds of times since then. And it's amazing how a dress and a memory somehow fit together for all time. The back of this dress is very different from the others. For a start, it does up at the back and the others do up at the front and there's no extra skirt attached to the top of the dress. It's just the plain skirt that's underneath. And as you can see here, it looks as though I didn't quite finish it or I put on a lot of weight since then. But in fact, it's pinned on like the other dresses, but onto a corset, which I just bought on Amazon. It's a plain cream corset. So you see all of the lacing, which looked really pretty at the back. I've actually recently bought a necklace from the couturier Reinhard Luthier, who was a co-founder of Adzaro and used to make all of their costume jewellery. And I think it would be perfect for this period. So I want to try it with the dress. Here we go. I'm going to try to put it this way. So it's open and pinned into place, which they did a lot in those days. So let's see if this is better. Oh, perfect. You see, I thought she was finished, but she wasn't. I wish I had this necklace for the party. This is the first time I'm seeing them together. Oh, it's such a great feeling when you finally find the right thing for something. These dresses are my alter egos and I'm constantly adding little bits to them and making improvements. So what party to have next? I think I'm going to leave her on the stand because she just looks so pretty in here. I'm happy that costume parties have become such a big part of life at La Lande because for me, buying a chateau was all about living a fairy tale. We can't protect ourselves from the harsher realities of life. We're all affected by illness and loss and grief and there's nothing that we can do to prevent that. But what is in our power is to make the other moments in our lives as beautiful and magical as possible. And here we do that by living in this magical place and by creating events where we can all come together and be creative and be silly and make our lives richer and more interesting together. I hope you've enjoyed listening to some of the silliness that we get up to here at La Lande and looking at the costumes that I've made with me. If you've liked this video and like anything to do with Chateau Life, please subscribe to this channel. I'll be talking about lots of things all based on Chateau living in the future. I hope you have a really wonderful Sunday and I think I'm going to spend the rest of the day exactly here reading my huge costume history. And I'll finally drink my tea.